We talked a bit about the, the classroom, setting the culture of the classroom, and I want to bring a little bit of the classroom flavour, classroom activity, if you like, to what we're talking about now. This idea about challenge and encouraging students to think independently, to share ideas with each other, to talk about their thinking. So I'm going to give you a little activity now. I gather you've all picked the intelligent person that you're going to work with now. So with that person, this should be easy. I'm going to ask you to look at these three pictures and decide which is the odd one out, which one's different, and why. You've got 30 seconds to decide in your pair. Which one's different and why? I can interrupt you there. So we were asking which is the odd one out and why. Let's see if anybody's feeling brave. I'm just going to cho we'll choose one of them. Let's start at the bottom right hand corner there, the hat over here. Did anybody make that one the odd one out? Yeah. Why might that one be the odd one out? Colour, it's yellow. Any other reason? It's something you wear at work. Thank you. Tough school you work in. <laughs> what about the top one? Did anybody make the top one the odd one out? Why might that one be the odd one out? It has a strap underneath. Could anybody make it the odd one out for a different reason? You need a horse for wearing that one. Or perhaps the horse could wear it too. Um, and what about the bottom left side? What about that last hat? A lot of people chose that one as the odd one out. Why is that one the odd one out? It's soft. Any other reason? It's warm. These two are for safety. This one is not for safety, softer, warmer. You've got the idea of how this one's working now. I'm going to put three more pictures up. This time, can you make each one the odd one out for a different reason? You've got 30 seconds with the person next to you. If I can interrupt your conversations again, please. Now, again, we could listen to all of your different reasons that you had. I could even write them up on the flip chart and write all your different reasons. I'm guessing you said things like, the duck is the odd one out because it's got two legs, it's got wings, it can fly, it lays eggs, it has a beak. Maybe the tiger is the odd one out because it eats meat, it's got a long tail, it has stripes. The hippo is the odd one out because it's in the wild, it's got a plain colour. 
those sorts of things. I could write all those ideas up on the screen, and we could all see our different ideas and share them. I always like doing that one with students because they will say things that you had never even expected when you put the pictures up. I was doing this with a class. They were a, a class of mixed year one and year two, so they were about six or seven. And there was a girl said that the duck was the odd one out because it has five feet. I said, five feet? Are you sure? <laughs> Should we check? Should we count together and just be sure about that? And she said, yes, it has. The duck's got two feet, one, two. Then there's two behind on the seagull, three, four. And then there's another one up at the top with his friends. There's five feet in it. Oh, okay. I put feet up on the pit. And the little boy said that the tiger was the odd one out. I said, the tiger's the odd one out? Why is the tiger the odd one out? He said, it's the only one where we know its name. I said, do we? What's his name? He said his name's Tim. <laughs> I said, okay, it's, it's Tiger Tim. Okay. What makes you think that? And at the bottom there, it's got copyright Tim Knight. Uh, <laughs> it's a very posh name for a tiger. I'm Tim Knight, Lord of the Jungle. Yeah. Anyway, you get all sorts of good things from the students. Um, we could carry on doing these all morning. You can, you can have pictures of anything up here and do an odd one out with the students. Um, <laughs> but I thought I'd share this one with you. This is one that um, a teacher was using recently in an art lesson. She was teaching 13, 14-year-old students, and she was doing a still life project. And she said what she would normally do is that she would put a bowl of fruit out on the table, and then she would show the students how to draw that, and then all the students would paint the bowl of fruit. And she said, oh, I came along and I, I like this odd one out idea. I'm going to use that at the start of my still life project. So she put three pictures of still lives up, and she asked the students, which is the odd one out and why? Just like you did. And they came up with different ideas. This one's the odd one out because it's only got one item and she wrote that on the flip chart. Uh, this one's the odd one out because it's got a dark background. The others have a light background. Oh, dark background, light background. This one's the odd one out because it has lots of items, lots of items in it. This one's the odd one out because you can see the brush strokes in it. And, the brush strokes. and she wrote down all the students' ideas. She then showed them another three still life paintings. They thought of the odd one out, and she wrote more ideas on the board. She showed them three more, and they added more. It's abstract, and so on. After looking at three sets of three, she had a big list of words on the board that the students had come up with. And she then said to them, you're going to be doing your own still life painting now. Look through the list of words. Which ones do you think would help you the most with your still life painting? So the students talked to each other, and they chose the words that they wanted. It's only got one item, it's got a dark background. You can see the brush strokes, for example. Once they had their three words chosen, their criteria, they set off designing their work, and they did their paintings. And all the way through the project, she kept coming back to the three criteria that they'd chosen. And she would say, oh, it says here you were going to have a dark background, but actually you've put quite a light background. Why did you do that? And the student would explain, well, my item was quite dark at the front. So I thought to make it stand out more, I'd put a light background in. So the students were reasoning through the choices that they'd made. So it's using a simple activity to encourage the students to talk and to think and to come up with their own criteria. Now, I chose that example because during that lesson, she had an inspector in the room. And in the UK, we're very fond of inspectors. We love having people coming into our classrooms and telling us what we're doing well or not. Uninvited. <laughs> But she had an inspector in. The inspector came in and he watched the odd one out activity. So he was in for five or six minutes and he watched the children choose their ideas and he saw them choose their criteria and he saw them get started with their painting. 
And then he went off to look at somebody else and tell them how well they were doing. He came back at the end of the session, and the feedback that she got was that that was a very good session. It was a very good session with some excellent teaching and learning. It was a very good session with some excellent teaching and learning. Now, you've heard about that activity, and you've had a go at an odd one out, so you know what it was they were doing in the classroom. With the person next to you again, just give you a minute. What do you think the excellent teaching and learning was in that activity? What was the excellent teaching and learning? I'll give you a minute to talk to the person next to you about that activity. Now, if we were to talk about what makes good teaching and learning, what's excellent teaching and learning, we could probably be here for the rest of the morning while we list good ideas that make up teaching, good teaching and learning. There are hundreds of things that factor in to good teaching and learning. And what I find difficult with that is that when you work in schools and you're trying to look at how do we improve teaching and learning, what works, what will help our students most, that actually there are so many things and they're written in so complicated a way that it's almost impossible to remember them on a daily basis. So if we really want to improve teaching and learning in our schools, we need something simple, memorable, and easy to take away. And I find, for me, that if you think about what makes good teaching and learning, most of the ideas fit under six key headings. That in the most effective sessions, Learning will be active, meaningful, challenging, collaborative, mediated, and reflective. Six key themes that crop up in research the world over for decades and decades tend to fit under these six themes. And what I mean by each of these is active, so the students get a chance to explore their own ideas. Meaningful. It's in a context that the students can engage with. They recognize how it fits with their learning. It fits with what they already know and where they're going next. So it's meaningful to them. It's challenging. It should make the students think. Mediate, uh, collaborative is where the students share ideas and work together. There's an opportunity for them to learn, to talk and to share rather than listening to the teacher, which is connected to the teacher's role, mediating. The teacher's role is to guide rather than to tell, not to give the answer, but to prompt with questions, to challenge, to support. And reflective, so the students have chance to think about their own learning. What do I know now that I didn't know before? What can I do now that I couldn't do before? Or perhaps just by hearing another answer, we change our minds. Getting students to change their minds is always a tough task. Reflection is key to changing your mind, being open-minded. Six key themes that make up the most effective teaching and learning sessions. Just going to give you a few seconds again to go into that list a little bit. Think back to the odd one out activity. Can you connect the activity that we did to those six themes? Are there any links between odd one out and our six themes for effective teaching and learning. I'll give you a minute with the person next to you again.
I'll just interrupt you again. Thank you. Did you manage to make some connections between the activity and the six themes? It's a very simple activity, isn't it? Very short, easy to prepare. You just need three pictures, three words, three numbers. Doesn't matter what you put up. The idea is to get the students thinking, to get them talking, to get them doing some of that hard work. As James said before, teaching is the only profession in the world where 25 people turn up every day to watch you work. <laughs> Give the students that work. Give them the effort. At the end of a session, you see teachers walking out, sweat on their brow. Oh, that was exhausting. Oh, God. The students walk out. Oh, it's another session done. I'm off for break now. Here we go. Even a simple activity like an odd one out can get the students doing the thinking, getting them doing the processing, making them more active. And actually, that activity is hard work, it's effortful, but it's rewarding. And for me, the key question about why we would do activities like that in the classroom is to encourage students to prepare for independent, lifelong learning. Developing the thinking that they need, that they will need for the rest of their lives. Developing the independence of thought to think, I can do this for myself. That it's okay to make a mistake and try again. And to really help students become more independent, to really prepare them for that lifelong learning. There are three key things in putting learning first. Develop a language for learning, have opportunities for challenge and reflection, and get effective feedback. When we come back after coffee, we'll pick up on those three themes in the next session before lunch. We have a half-hour coffee break now. Uh, coffee is served back where you came in. Good luck getting out and back in again in half an hour. <laughs>